on the right panel on the top is what you must have seen if any of you have gone to some of the areas in Himachal and Uttar Uttarakhand. You will see many perennial trees with this kind of a bushy appearance. At the bottom, you see a normal flower, and the normal plant, because of the hijacking which I am talking about, has become green in color. So, this is what I am going to talk about today. Next, please. So, this kind of a hijacking is actually has been found to be caused or associated with an organism which is called as phytoplasma. And this phytoplasma, this paper came in nature, it was entitled Phytoplasma converts plants into zombies. Because plants look so weird, so weird, that they almost look like they look like zombies. Next please. So as many of us are not really familiar with phytoplasma, I would just like to give you a very brief introduction of what is phytoplasma. Next. So phytoplasma were earlier called as mycoplasma-like organisms. MLOs, you all must have heard of. So those mycoplasmas which are found to be associated with plants have been named as phytoplasma. They didn't even have a name for a very long time. They are from positive bacteria. They were once circular chromosomes and sometimes some plasmids. And their closest free-living ancestor is a polyplasma. They belong to division molecules, class molecules, and just skipping certain things, but you please mark the word. I have used the term candidate as phytoplasma here. So their taxonomy has not been firmly established. So in such cases, we use the word candidate, which is a potentially which should be named as phytoplasma. So we refer to it as C A phytoplasma, candidate as phytoplasma. That is why it always should note that we have not been italicized the word phytoplasma. Next please. So these phytoplasma are very unique bacteria. Not only they are unique organisms within the bacteria group of organisms also they are very unique because they are voiceless. There are many features which make it very unique. They do not have a bacterial cell wall as normally bacteria have. They have a very small genome, intriguingly small genome, which is not difficult if you can remember that the smallest synthetic organism which Craig Bender had made was a mycoplasma. Because this group of people that was the easiest one to make a synthetic organism, which is a close relative of hydroplasma. It has extremely low GC content, again a very abnormal feature. It has lost 75% of its genes. It is reducing its genome like anything. And despite being a prokaryote, despite having a very small genome, it has a very high repetitive gene, which is again a very exceptional thing. In most of the molecules, UGA is a stop product. Again, so in the genetic code also, it has some very unusual features. And the most interesting thing, or most challenging thing I should say about phytoplasma is that nobody has been able to culture its water. It's an unculturable organism. There are some reports, there have been some reports two years back about claims to have cultured it, but excellent cultures, but they have not really stood the test of time. And it has a trans kingdom existence. I was talking about plants. So this phytoplasma spends part of its life in the plant, another part in insects. Next, please. So it is an extremely important organism because it is the cause of diseases in more than 200 economically important plants. And there are very little attempts which have been made in India to the losses which are caused by phytoplasma associated diseases, but very some information is there because it is a very serious uh, disease causing organism in coconuts, in apple trees. 
Next, please. And the irony is that though it is a plant pathogenic bacteria, in at least one of the plant, it is the cause of its enhanced ornamental value. If you see that plant, which is a poinsettia, a very common, popularly used ornamental plant, the branching pattern, again because it is, it hijacks the development pattern. So it has changed the branching pattern of the plant, making poinsettias more beautiful. So that is the positive side of it. Otherwise, it's a pathogenic bacteria. Next, please. As I said, it has a transcendent existence. So it's like it, it resides in many of the perennial trees or some of the weeds and the sap sucking insects exclusively, only sap sucking, low end sap sucking insects, when they visit a plant which is already having phytoplasma infestation in it, they acquire it within their body and this is called as acquisition phase. And when such an insect, which has is now become virulent, when it visits a healthy plant, but because it's a sap sucking insect, it introduces its proboscis inside the flowing sap, it releases these bacteria also. And these bacteria now when they start residing in the host plant, now become the new host of the phytoplasm. And this is how the cycle goes on. So it has a, we call it a transcendent existence. So these are the various symptoms phytoplasma can cause in plants, which a plant pathologist calls fasciation, yellowing, little leaf, bitter cells, which is blooming, phyllody, stunting, white leaf. Next please. But as a botanist, I mean from the plant background, we like to see it differently. What a plant pathologist calls which is blue. A botanist will say, shortening of internodes and actually shoot out the What the plant pathologist speaks in virescence, I as a botanist would like to call it greening of the flowers or the floral words. Similarly, a phyllody is a very common disease for a plant pathologist, but as a botanist, we like to say that appearance of shoots from within the flowers. Similarly, fasciation, when the stem becomes dorsal ventrally flattened. The pathologist calls it a fasciation. For us, it's a very abnormal stem development, which normally doesn't happen in the Next, please. So, this is with this pattern, I would like to tell you that because it was uncultured, I don't have time to go into the history of it, but for a very long time, it was being all the symptoms which I mentioned were believed to be caused by viruses because many of them overlap with viral diseases. So for years and years people thought that it is a virus which is the agent that causes these diseases. And very late, I mean it's just only about three decades, that it was established beyond doubt that it is actually a bacteria which is the cause of such diseases. We don't even use the word cause even today because the Koch postulate has not been possible because it is not cultural. So, very strictly, we say phytoplasma associated symptoms. Because unless Koch postulate is proven for a particular pathogen, we cannot say cause. This paper came in science in 2009. So, you can understand it is such a recent line of work which may have been that phytoplasma research begins to do. And our group, for some reason, we had started working on it just, I think, 2006 or 7 on phytoplasm. Before that, as I mentioned in the morning, I was working on lab producing system. And because of some reason that we had reached a stage that if I had to go any further, I had to go into the insect genetics. Because I told you that we were finding some bacterial association also in the insect. And that bacterial association was of extreme significance. That bacteria, as many of you know, is Wolbachia, which we found for the first time. It is the first report of Wolbachia in that insect. And Wolbachia is a very well-known sexual manipulator. It converts 
male insects into females. And since lac is produced only by the female insects, so it was a very important tool to increase the production of lac. But for that we had to understand how one bacteria manipulates the sex of the insect and for that we had to understand how sex is determined in case of lac insect. And lac insect cytologically is a very difficult system, so it has holotype chromosomes. Even getting a good preparation is also very, very difficult in it. It's holocentric chromosome it has. So that led me to look for a system in which there is a microorganism which is leading to a very strong manipulation of the host plant. So from there I was, of course I was working on system even before that, even when I was in Indonesia. But fortunately for me, Sysamum is one of a very, very, very uh, badly affected host of phytoplasma. So I could shift to phytoplasma and associated diseases in Sysamum plant because of two reasons. Next, please. So these are the different organisms on which we have been, different plants on which we have been working. We have been showing the role of phytoplasma in the kind of diseases which are caused, but essentially from the point of view of plant development changes. And the crop on which we focused more, we concentrated more, as I said, was Sismo. Sismo indicum is well known plant, which we call an oil seed crop thing. Next, please. No, before that, yeah. So Sismo indicum, for the sake of students, is a very important oil seed crop with very high potential. In the other area, it's a very important crop. And its oil is very important because it is unsaturated, yet has high stability. Because it has some, so it is again a very unusual property. Most of the stable oils are saturated. Most of the unsaturated oils are not stable. They are subject to the acidity. So system oil is unique in that sense, that it's unsaturated yet highly stable at room temperature because of the antioxidants that exist in any such minerals as the contains. Next. So these are the different kind of symptoms phytoplasma can cause in thin plant. You can see the first one is a healthy plant and then if it is infested by phytoplasma, it leads to all the kinds of symptoms. You can see this page Z2, only green flowers you can see. And in the advanced stages, from within those green flowers, as I mentioned, the shoots start emerging. And since it's not really important part of the system of plant is its seed, because it's an oil thing, so obviously the loss of economic yield is massive. There is up to 100% yield loss in system. 30 to 100% seed loss, yield loss takes place. And there is, next please. So this is how it looks. The flower becomes completely green. And I, there are so many uh, things I worth mentioning. But I would like to just mention one thing here. In the last panel, you can see here, its typical flower has two nectaries subtending on both the sides. A normal flower has two nectaries on either side. When there is phytoplasma infestation, those nectaries become flowers. So, you know what Bothe had said so many years ago that the flower is a modified shoot. And evolutionarily, it took millions of years for a shoot to become an endospermic flower. This bacteria can do it in days. It converts a normal flower into a vegetative shoot. So that is the kind of hijacking this bacteria can do. And not only that, this, you can hardly see, there are yellow colored nectaries. This is a published work. Nobody knew what is the origin, what is the nature of these nectaries. And because they turned into flowers, 
we could propose that those nectaries are actually modified flowers. Because when the phytoplasma infestation was there, the whole development pattern changed. Those modified flowers which had become nectaries, they again became flowers. So this is what my group has been working on to find out what is happening actually. What is phytoplasma doing actually to these plants? Next. So to start with, so we have been working on it as I told you more than two decades now. I just give you a very overview or a glimpse of the kind of work which is the work of many five to six PhD students. So one of the things was to see what are the different strains of phytoplasma which are interest in the system plant in India. I must tell you that there are very few states in India, I think barring higher altitudes of Himachal and Kashmir, there is no state in India which does not grow, you know, uh, system. It's grown almost throughout the country and in northern part we take one crop a year, in southern areas we take two crops a year and in northeastern region we take three crops a year. And everywhere phytoplasma infects. And being in NDPGR we have the global direction of phytoplasma of system of data. We have a published paper we had shown that the Indian germplasm is more diverse than the global germplasm. And none of the existing germplasm in India or globally has any resistance or even tolerance to phytoplasma. And it's a recalcitrant system when it comes to its regeneration for our transformation. Its regeneration itself is very difficult and its transformation is also very difficult. So it's considered it comes into the category of the recalcitrant system. So this is the last. So this is to start with as a in the starting work. We have collected system and plants showing the symptoms of you know such symptoms which are normally associated with phytoplasma from all over the country. We go about you know using there are as I told you it cannot be cultured, so there are nowadays and in fact the, when I showed that paper slide which showed phytoplasma research begins to bloom, it is only because when molecular tools were available using PCR based techniques we can actually detect it. It's only then that phytoplasma research actually began. So we have to use specific primers to first show what is the strain which is present in whether it is present or not and then it is, if it is present which strain it is. And then next, if it is there, then haplotyping characterization of the phytoplasma strains which are infesting different parts of the country growing system and crop. Next. Next. So once we had the molecular characterization of the phytoplasma strains affecting different crops uh, uh, in within the country, we have gone about finding out the relationships between them, how these strains are evolving, which are the areas which have uh, similar strains or which are the areas which have diverse strains or where the most high mutation rate is taking place, what is the evolutionary force, so what are the evolutionary forces which are acting upon the different phytoplasma strains which are infesting here we and we have worked on other crops also but for today I will be focusing only on the system of the crop. Next please. So having surveyed the phytoplasma strains which are affecting system crop in the country since my process entitled mechanism underlying the symptom development, the question which comes to the mind is why is it important to understand the mechanism? I've given you the reason that being from the, coming from the biology, plant biology background, the kind of symptoms which are normally associated with phytoplasma uh, infected plants are very intriguing for a plant biology. So that itself provides a very interesting system to have a very unconventional approach to understand plant development. How can the bacteria actually redirect a plant to, instead of making a flower, you stop and now start making a leaf. Not only petals, every whirl of the flower 
right from statements to reviews, everything becomes a review. So this is most, I mean, for us, it's a very, very intriguing thing. And of course, once we understand the mechanism, now coming to the heavy metal part of it, once we understand the mechanism, underlying this peculiar symptom development, probably we get some help in devising the control measures of the disease, which are specific factors. So this is the kind of study we have been doing. Next. So before we went to the molecular approaches, we did a lot of you know, traditional studies like simple anatomy. How does a leaf, which is now converted from a pattern to leaf, differ from a normal leaf? So every part which was changing normal pattern changed into leaf. Using light microscopy, electron microscopy, 10 and to the cell, we started the entire histology of the process which is involved in the bacteria symptom development in the system. Next, please. Next. So I was mentioning about inoculation feeding and acquisition feeding. That the extensive vector which brings the phytoplasma to the plant. And then the plant starts behaving differently. Hopefully it can come its normal development. Next. But what is important to mark here is that another very peculiar feature of phytoplasma is that it is vasculature limited. It remains within the floor. It cannot cross the respiratory of the plant. And most of these decisions, whether the plant will become a flower or a shoot, or a vegetative shoot or a flowering shoot, that decision is taken in the shoot epithelial western region, where the respiratory is not there. So how phytoplasma is able to exercise or exert its influence on the shoot epithelial western, which is the region where the symptoms will be now taking place. So for that reason, next, it has been proposed that these bacteria, they produce some secretory substances in the phloem. They reside in the phloem and those secretory substances they are released into the phloem and then slowly they reach the shoot epithelial system. There they actually control the developmental program of the plant and change it according to their okay. So this is again, this is a normal system of the plant, healthy plant, and in the insect releases something in the phloem and then what has been called as effector molecules and resulting in this kind of a plan. Next. So this is the study that we used to always use. Phytoplasma uh, affected green flower green shoot in comparison to the normal healthy system plant. Next. So now, where all the effectors might, or what stages these effectors might exert their influence? From so the epithelial meristem, green process meristem to floral meristem to floral organs. So these effectors can be actually affecting in any of these stages. So it is important to understand the whole normal development of the system and plant vis-a-vis then now the plants which are under modification because of the presence of hydroplasma. Next. Uh, I think we can say next, please. Okay. So another question which anybody should ask is that why is phytoplasma doing this? Why phytoplasma is producing effectors in such a way that instead of now producing flowers or a normally old plant, they start making shoots? Or in fact, if you go to the field anywhere in India, from a distance itself, you can see some plants which are greener than others. So basically, what has been proposed is that this kind of a planning or an unholy kind of a uh, feature that happens is basically phytoplasma is enhancing the life of the host plant. 
it is not allowing it to complete the life cycle because it is transmitted by an insect vector which is a flowing sac sucking insect. If the plant completes its life, then the plant will dry up. And the insect, which is the vector of the phytoplasma, will not yet flow. So in order to ensure continued supply of flowing sap from the plant, it is actually extending the vegetative phase of the plant. It's delaying its completion of life. That is what is the that is what is believed to be the reason for such peculiar symptoms of dreaming of a normal flower in case of plasma associated uh, diseases. Right? Yes, please. So, again, now coming back to my research, we uh, different receptors have been identified. My group has been uh, working on identification detection identification and characterization of all the effectors which have been reported in phytoplasma from all over the world. And we try to see, again, using PCR-based technique, using specific primers, we detect the presence of those primers. We have, as I told you in the first, I mentioned the first slide, we have a very good collection from all over the country of symptomatic plants, which we now have already characterized that they have presence of phytoplasma. Now when we know that they have a presence of hydroplasma, now we want to see which are the effectors which are present in them. Different effectors, one or many or more than one at the same time. Next, so this is a representative slide. Again, just we had done haplotyping analysis of the hydroplasma. We are doing haplotype analysis of the effect molecules also and we are trying to see the evolutionary forces which are working on those effectors. Next, please. In but I just conclude that what so far we have found is that evolutionary forces working on the effectors are not the same as they are working on 16S or the species phylogeny of the phytoplasma. They are going into different ways. Next. So we have very interesting results in which we have seen major deletions in one of the vector molecules, CD, which is the most important vector molecule at least. Uh, if we are working in the case of Sicily, we have found very interesting results. There are diverse changes, there are deletions, there are substitutions at the nucleotide level. We see tremendous variation that we see in some of them. Next. Next. Yeah. So, uh, when we studied in detail, one of the vector molecules, which is called as SAP54, we found Ever studies found that the SAP 54, which has been reported in other crops from other places, is different from what is actually present in a Vicisalon crop in India. Next, and very clearly, we, when we did this is called as film varieties. So we have called it as SAP 54 like protein. But this is not identical to the SAP 54, which has been reported in other plants. Next. So we compared sequence by sequence the SAR 54, which has been reported by other people, and SAR 54, which is affecting Indian system crops. Next, please. And we could find that there are very significant SNPs. In this case, we did not find any deletions, but there were SNPs. And last one, we had those SNPs have been having non synonymous mutations showing as well as synonymous. And non synonymous mutations were much more than the synonymous ones. So the difference is very significant. So the mechanism of protection also, even if somebody reports from any other part of the world, is going to be different because the structure of the protein is different than all of this. Next, please. So this led us to looking for the interacting partner of this effector molecule. Because this effector molecule is secreted by the phytoplasma. And I told you that this reaches the shoot epithelium dome. And then it affects. So some protein or some process or some moiety of the host plant has to interact with it. Only then the kind of effect it produces is possible. So this is led to the search for the interacting partner of that particular 
From this same post plan, using the these two heading approach, just for the sake of students, I will quickly mention that we clone the effective molecule in a specific strain, and we just create a library of the host plan, that is the in this case. And this is a typical these two heading approach to look for a partner, and then these both the strains are mated with each other and following the typical right-to-edge protocol. We could and we confirm that making this taking place between the two strains, one having the CDNA of the host, the other one having the effective molecule gene, we could find some interacting molecules. I am telling you, it's a very long story. This is a one and a half year long experiment. I am just telling you the gist of it. Next, please. So we could identify the interactors of sacred before system. The strongest interactor which we found of sacred before system was E3 ubiquitin ligase. Now, E3 ubiquitin ligase was a very interesting finding because this is a part of what we call as the protozoal machinery of the plant. Protozoal, again, for the sake of students, I would like to mention that ubiquitin is kind of a tag when any system has to degrade the protein, it puts a ubiquitin in it. So moment the ubiquitin is put on a protein, this is the protozoal machinery starts breaking. So one thing that came out of this study was that SAF 54 makes an alliance with E3 ubiquitin ligase and this system, next please, Next. So this is the kind of model we have proposed from one of my students work. That we have a floral quartet model, ABC model if you remember. So this effector goes and interacts with the E3 ubiquitin ligase and this now joint molecule goes and attacks those transcription factors which are directly controlling the normal floral development. Because it is not annoying that typical transcription factors that ABC model, quartet model to operate normally. So this is the lead we got from this study. Next please. Next. So since this is this is just one part of the story, I will briefly go through the other strategies or other uh, methods we are trying to understand. We are approaching the problem from as many angles as possible. So we also did a methyl because there are some reports that bacteria, some bacteria at least, can actually bring epigenetic changes in the genome of the host plant. And that can result in different type of regulation of some very important genes. So we wanted to compare the methylation pattern of the genome of the system, which is healthy and which is infected by the cytoplasm. Next. Next. This is, I think is that. Next. 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 Yeah. Okay, so I will again just give you the final results that we could find differential methylation very distinctly in the plants which are affected by phytoplasma because this is a kind of a genetic change which is possible. But the results were again very interesting. The intergenic regions were much more differentially methylated in comparison to the promoter regions, in comparison to exon regions, and in comparison to exonic regions in the same order. Next. All the three kinds of methylations, if you are familiar, there are three kinds of methylations which take place. We got interesting results in all the three types of methylations. Yes, next please. Next. I think we skip that and go from. Some of the transposons like Gypsy and Copia, uh, again, because they are very important for many developmental pathways, point of view also. That was a very interesting finding again that in some of the transposons we found that there was a potential methylation which was taking place as a result of that infection. So it might be altering the uh, methylation pattern also. And the two transposons which we found very distinctly getting altered for gypsy and phobia. Next. Uh, okay. So 
So uh, again, to look at the transcription of the host plant, we subjected it to dual uh, transcriptome analysis. Dual transcriptome analysis again was a professional on us because as I said, cytoplasma cannot be captured, so we have to do, if we have to understand what is actually cytoplasma coding for, we have to do, use this approach to it, I speak analysis. So now we have a very elaborate transcription profiling of the host plant as well as the phytoplasma. And just to see what actually is happening at the transcription level. This is a pipeline which we have used for the Phytoplasma uh, genome uh, transcription as well as the host plant uh, transcription. Next. Next, please. Yeah. So, in the host plant, I used the host plant, I could uh, actually get about 24, more than 24,000 genes, and very really interestingly, as a result of phytoplasma infection, nearly 600 genes were found to be activated, and nearly 700 genes were found to be down designated. And almost 9,000, 10,000 genes were not affected by hypercosmic infection. Next. So we have done the functional allocation of all the genes which we have found, particularly the differentially regulated genes. Next. And we have using eight pathways, we have mapped them into different pathways. We know which are the pathways which are major targets of these differentially regulated genes. Next. We have already done, uh, so we selected some genes which were more significantly getting differentially expressed as a result of hypoplasmic infection, and the 21 uh, flowering and hormone uh, involved uh, synthesis involved genes we validated also using PCR, and we are getting very confirmatory results of differential expression of some genes which are directly involved either in the flowering of the plant or in the hormone synthesis of the plant which are getting affected by the plasma. We also supported eggs. We also supported these results, confirmed these results by doing the actual hormone estimation of the shootlets which are either healthy or effective. Uh, the student whose work is this is sitting here. Can you just stand for a minute? So she is this student. Who is <laughs> so this last part what I am mentioning is her work actually. Next. So these are okay. So in the up and down regulated genes, very interestingly, we found some transcription factors. And those transcription factors are now we are analyzing in depth. And we are trying to see which are the transcription factors which are more getting adversely affected by phytoplasma infection. Next. Next. Okay. So we could also get a glimpse of the phytoplasma transcriptome because we had a dual RNAC, which is otherwise difficult because it cannot be cultured. We have to have a very different approach. We have to have a ribosomification method, which is again a very complicated method. So we now have a snapshot of the phytoplasma expression of the genes also. Next. Next, please. Next. Next, next, next. So there are some very interesting findings. They are still in process. We are trying to validate some. And some very interesting leads which we have that some of the genes are getting overly expressed in phytoplasma, much beyond the expectation of any bacterial gene which are not being even named as infectors. So we are trying to see if those genes can be also called as infectors, but they have to fit into some criteria first. So there are very, very uh, broad knowledge gaps still remaining. We have the important needs, but the precise mechanisms which are involved are yet to be eliminated in order to identify the vulnerable points which can be the targets in tomorrow's future studies yeah. if we have to break this unholy alliance of phytoplasma with some of the host proteins which are actually helping phytoplasma infectors to cause these symptoms. Okay, so there are many, like some studies, whatever latest studies are available in international literature also, they are doing on Arabidopsis. So that is why we are both choosing, we have chosen a difficult system, as I told you, this is not a difficult system, but at least it is the natural host 
Epilepsy is never affected by mycoplasma. So any finding which you, even if you get from epilepsy, is not going to be transferable to the crop plants. Next, please. Okay, so I will all that negativity, which I am made phytoplasma villain. So I will just let you leave you with this, that phytoplasma can cast a magic spell that turns the fair points of hair into the Christmas showpiece. Next. So last one, please. Last one. So this is what the normal branching pattern is erect. That is the normal points of hair. And then the phytoplasma is infected. The branching pattern changes, and that is why the, whatever points of hair you get mostly in the market are basically phytoplasma infected. And since they are vegetatively propagated, but it doesn't really mean anything. And in order to get a healthy one, you the channel is through somatic embryos. So if you have to give a, get a healthy phytoplasma, once a plant, they have done tissue culture, they have done somatic embryos, and from that they have to choose. Because all the plants which you get ornamented once a year in the market are all phytoplasma infected. Thank you, and let me leave you. Thank you.